Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Layer by Layer, the show about 3D printing and our place inside of the industry. Today, we're going to be talking about 3D Evo, Nexa, and Essentium, and then how a robot arm on the back of a trailer is able to make houses. But before all that, let's get into our sponsor. If you love books but can't find the time to read, Audible is your go-to solution. With thousands of audio books and podcasts, you can listen to your favorite stories anywhere, anytime. And here's the best part. By using our special link in the bio, you can get an exclusive 30-day free trial plus one free audiobook credit and two credits if you are already a Prime member. So why wait? Give Audible a listen today. Now let's get into the video. We're trying out something new with that, guys. So, uh, yeah, there is, we're doing ads on the podcast right now. So just putting that out there. But, uh, yeah, Audible's uh, easy to work with and clean and all the rest of it. So we'll do that. Uh, if you happen to be in the 3D printing world and want to do a sponsorship, we're open to doing that. But, anyhow, slight modification to stuff right there. But, yeah, Audible is actually really great. The audio books are, uh, yeah, the audio books are good over there if you just want to have the... Uh, Want to read without having to read. But, okay, uh, into the news. And then we'll talk about Tangled and the testing Kickstarter. Uh, 3D Evo in unveils three-tiered project partnership business model. Um, Extrusion 3D, this is via TCT. Extrusion 3D printing company 3D Evo has announced a new project partnership business model as sales of its filament maker 3D printer series are ceased. So 3D Evo makes a box. And you drop in filament scrap in the top of it, basically, and it was able to extrude uh, filament. Uh, it's uh, been reasonably, I'm going to say it's been reasonably pop. It's been present. I don't know how popular it's been. But it has definitely been one of the desktop extruders that people have used out there. But very clearly, they haven't been selling enough of them to have a viable business model. Um, and this is something that a lot of hardware manufacturers run into a lot. So they're effectively going to what would be a subscription model, even though they're calling it a partnership model, but they will lease the machine to companies and allow those companies to use it for like development of materials and testing and that kind of stuff, because then they have long-term recurring revenue. Um, because filament making machines don't have a lot of parts that can break a decent number, but they would generally last, generally last about two years. Um, and there's just not enough turnover and not enough utilization or interest in desktop filament manufacturing to do it. So they're trying to find a more lucrative business model because they, if it was working, they wouldn't change it effectively. Uh, so good. It's, it's neat to see that type of a pivot. Uh, they are ramping down machining sales and are basically turning them off here probably within about a week of this podcast. But the overall, it's not that surprising. It's uh, fairly common for people to make these types of models. Like Carbon 3D uses a machine rental model. Uh, who else does it? There's, there's one other 3D printer company who does I can't remember who it is right now. But I know Carbon was the big one uh, because it allowed them to continuously develop the machines. And as they got new versions of the machines in, you could like upgrade them or whatever happened to be. So it was a way to make sure there was always money in the till. So yeah, that. Uh, RIC Technology launches new automated robotic arm construction 3D printer. It says it's a, uh, yeah, the RIC-M1 Pro robotic arm printer is able to achieve the cost and time saving potential through advancements including a compact size and modular design, 30% more footprint, one third reduction in skilled labor required, and three eighths mixture pump included. That's kind of an interesting way of proving that. It reduces labor, reduces footprint, and there's a 3 8 pump mixture pump included. Okay. Uh, RIC says the new printer is much smaller in size compared to the gantry-based system and requires no assembly and can be in operation in two to four hours once on the construction site. So the big thing they're harping on here is the fact that those large gantry printers, like uh, Icon is one of the companies that produces those. Those large gantry print printers are a structure that you have to assemble at the construction site and make sure it's all straight and true and all the rest of it. So it takes uh, two or three days to install the gantry system before printing can start. They are hoping that this, this is effectively a robot arm on a semi-trailer, really what it is. 
Uh, they're hoping that you can just back the trailer up and the arm is able to adjust to the, the situation more flexibly than like a gantry system to where they can uh, start printing more quickly. But quite frankly, the, all I saw inside the article were renders of this thing. And the renders of the thing look like it's, sure, maybe it has a bigger build volume than the previous one, but the previous one must have been small because this one looks small. Uh that being said, this type of model where you just wheel it in on a trailer and grow something, backyard sheds, in little alcoves and stuff or like freaking playhouses, that kind of thing. Um, so long as they're safe and reliable and that kind of stuff, you could print like an igloo or a beehive or a, a man cave or whatever else it happens to be in the back of backyards and that kind of thing or small sheds or porta potty or whatever it happens to be these small structures to where somebody could get a hold of one of these machines and just crank these things out and build like two sheds in an afternoon or something by basically backing up the trailer and saying right there that that's an interesting model i don't that's not what these guys are doing that this is me projecting uh, thinking of the cool way of going at 3D construction while it's still being adopted. That's an early adopter, low cost entry weight point to it. And also, if you're putting in these little backyard sheds uh, at houses, when people have folks over, they get to see them. It's an odd thing. They get to talk about it. People get to push on it and say, oh, wow, that's real stable. And then they can think about, oh, maybe we could do that for a whole house. Well, yeah, sure, Frank, why not? But is what it is. Uh, Beretta Medical harnesses materialized CoAM for the additive manufacture of bestoke leg braces. BMI is a family-owned business of just five people. Despite its modest staffing numbers, the t- company typically has demand for around 2,000 braces a year, though it can take one person an entire day to work on a single unit. So this is good. Uh, knee braces. Uh, Beretta does knee braces, which are a uh, very common uh, type of thing to be 3D printed that makes sense in that context because they just allow everybody to really hold on. I'm being professional and finally silencing my phone. The uh, but the Beretta braces is a great application because they're able to effectively scan a leg or get basic measurements of the leg and make a knee brace that fits better. Because right now the alternative is a Velcro strap and a generic sized knee brace, which very often it chafes a lot. <laughs> From experience, uh, the so uh, a bespoke version of this is great. Materialize would be a good fit because yeah, I, I believe they're using an SLA process on this that's then polished, and it lets you build a brace much more quickly because you're not having to tweak and carve and all the rest of it on these things. Two thousand braces a year is a good solid business uh, for what these things are. There, I mean that's. That's a good operation. But this is also a really good example of where customization is actually useful. Medical fitting to human body applications are really good applications of 3D printing. Because number one, they're very often high margin because they're medical stuff. But they're also a reason to be customized. Customization is not necessarily a good feature for 3D printing. A lot of people have tried to apply customization to like consumer products where it's like, oh, you can have it in any color and you can take a picture of your face and make a bobblehead that's your face. That model has been tried many times and has failed many times because consumers do not want that much choice. And if you want proof that consumers don't want that much choice, iPhone. There's four colors of the iPhone or whatever else it was. But consumers are not that interested in customization of general daily purchases. They want the Tupperware to work. They want the phone to work. A few fashionistas want an Uber customized thing, but not a lot of them. Those are a fairly rare market segment. Okay. Uh, Nexa 3D completes acquisition of Essentium, adding high speed extrusion to its AM portfolio. Uh, Blake uh, Typel uh, will be appointed as the chief strategy officer of Nexa 3D. He was previously the CEO of Essentium. Uh, Going forward, Essentium will now be uh, Essentium, a Nexa 3D company. This happened really fast. So this deal, this this letter of intent was announced about uh, in November. It was announced in November. And they closed the deal here just uh, a week or so ago. That's a that's a really fast turnaround given the size that these companies previously were. 
uh, we, we discussed it back when the deal was announced. I think Essentium was trying to go to uh, do a SPAC uh, back in 2021, 20, 22 uh, for about a billion dollars and it fell through. And then they got into a little bit of trouble uh, from that because that was meant to be funding for all the stuff that they were doing. So there, there's two reasons that something like this happens. Number one, everybody just knows each other and they're able to close it, which is true. They had been courting each other for a while. In the, the previous story, it, it had been quoted that uh, uh, the, the CEOs of Nexa and Essentium had been talking for quite a while, getting to know each other. So they knew it was a fairly good fit when they went into this. Uh, and then all they had to do was diligence, which is double checking the books, see where the money actually is, final valuation kind of offer, that kind of thing. Uh, and as we discussed, this was very probably a primarily stock uh, deal to where uh, Essentium now gets access to kind of the cash reserves that Nexa has. And Nexa gets access to high-speed extrusion. And the two companies merge, and Essentium basically takes on Nexa stock um, as part of the merger. Um, so acquisition might be more of a, a slight misnomer, might be a slight misnomer. That being said, that's all speculation. Maybe Nexa just ponied up a little bit of cash for like $50 million and bought Essentium. I don't think so. Essentium, I don't think dropped in value that much. But that is me thinking. And you all know what, and that's, we all know what's bad about when that happens. Um, Tangled Filament Update. Oh, guys, yeah, earlier this week. Hey. Yeah. Big thing, big spools. Uh, so yes, the Tangled Filament, we've released a four kilogram spool. Uh, this is actually kind of a big deal. We really enjoyed this. This let us drop uh, the cost of filament by another 10%. Uh, so if you have a one kilogram spool or four one kilogram spools, you have to spool each one of those spools. You then have to package each one of those spools. You have to change out all of those spools on the machinery that's doing it. Um, so reducing those four operations to just one saves a lot of labor. Also, uh, with this four kilogram spool, it fits in a nice box that is still within the size to where we can ship it reasonably affordably. Uh, most areas. And like we say on our master plan, the logistics component is another thing we're optimizing. And with our Austin office, that'll be uh, uh, improved even more. But yeah, the filament uh, has been updated to a four kilogram spool. Since we only have one spool, we only have to buy one spool. And there's a lot of economy of scale on this because these spools are not four times more expensive than a single one kilogram spool. Also, from an environmental component and that kind of thing, this spool is very material efficient. So like the, the inner core only has these three spokes, the bare minimum that they need, and then the outer flanges. For a large spool like this, a number of people had mentioned on the last video, can we do a refill spool on this? And the answer is no. <laughs> the reason being, uh, it's almost, I'm not gonna say impossible, but stupidly hard. Uh, spoolless uh, filament is something we've worked on since the very first days it happened. I mean, we made one of the very first master spools and worked with a manufacturer on it. The problem with spoolless filament is that all of these little circles, these tubes that are stacked up, do not want to sit in a square. You can get away with it just barely with uh, a one kilogram spool. But if something goes wrong, the whole thing kind of melts and squashes and goes out of square. So then it doesn't fit on a master spool anymore. With this great big one, that definitely is going to happen because you just can't keep enough structure in there for the amount of mass and settling that it wants to do. So no, this will never be a, a reuse spool. It also shouldn't be because a reuse spool, again, at this scale starts to become chintzy very easily. So it's not, it's not very useful. Uh, for these print farm spools, though, uh, our spool return program still applies. If you want to ship these back to us, you absolutely can, and we will take them and reuse them. But it is on you to ship them and return them. We have not created a credit system or anything like that because it's just there's not enough demand for it. Um, and quite frankly, in the context of reducing cost of filament, spool return programs are not efficient. If people who want to do it for the environmental and the efficiency component want to do it, they absolutely can. But operationally, we're not able to support that right now um, with all the other stuff that we're doing. 
Oh, the other thing, longer term, is uh, if you're running an extrusion line, when a single spool fills up, you got to pull it and take it off. This can either be done manually or robotically. We, we have a winder that's able to do it in a slightly more automated fashion. But the, uh, the, 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 that process is we speed up the extrusion speed and make it four times faster. Now, if, if you're doing it the traditional way, which is a manual person pulling it off, that manual person has to go from pulling it off every couple minutes to pulling it off every 30 seconds. And that's almost physically impossible for a person. It's like if you've ever seen like the videos of like Tesla making batteries and they're making like a thousand batteries a minute or something like that, just crazy fast. It's like trying to imagine, okay, we're going to line a thousand people up in a line and we're going to make a thousand batteries a minute. It's just, it's physically impossible. People just can't do it. Um, this helps with it. This serves as kind of a stopgap because even though we just sped up the extrusion line 4X, uh, you're still changing out spools at the same rate. So if somebody has to pull this off manually, if we're using a manual winder system, um, it's still at the same speed as the one kilogram spools, but we're making four times as much filament, which again, reduces the labor cost. So uh, right now, yes, the cost per kilogram on this is $18. We're doing black. Um, this also, by the way, the size of spool really helps for the people on the other end because now you don't have to change out filament all the time and you get more print, print time out of your machine. So if you're using like a high speed machine and it's burning through filament like they do, uh, then now rather than having it stop at midnight every night and then sit idle until eight in the morning when you get up and want to change it out, you can instead just put a big spool on there and you don't have to change spools out so much, which saves you a bunch of effort and your printer gets to be used more continuously because it's not going to stop in the middle of the night all the time. So you get more print hours out of your machine. Additionally, large format machines like the Gigastorm from Elegoo, uh, they need big spools. That thing looks like it's supposed to be loaded up with a one kilogram spool. It's a meter in size. What one kilogram spool part is gonna print a meter in size? I don't think you can do a vase mode large vase with a single kilogram of filament in that size scale. Um, so you have to have bigger spools of filament and large format enables that. So there's all kinds of efficiencies. It makes it easier for the print users because they don't have to change out spools so often. It makes it easier for us because we don't have to change out spools so often. So it helps us to save cost. This is also, all of those efficiencies, like uh, the faster winding and faster extrusion speed, have not been implemented yet. So we are still in a mode uh, where there, there's those cost advantages can still be recognized. So we're on a good roadmap to continue decreasing the cost of filament. I think we'll get down to about $15 here in another month or two. So we will have gone from $21 when we first did the launch, the first launch of Tangled PLA, down to uh, 15 in the span of about three to four months, which in the industry hasn't really happened. Everybody's tweaking back down and prices are lowering, but for a U.S. manufacturer of filament, that puts us almost at half cost of nearly everybody else of the other U.S. brands that we know about. That being said, we're super focused. We're focused on black PLA. That is the core product. Diversification is an easy way to increase complexity and increase cost. We will probably introduce other colors of filament into the future, but they will probably be more expensive because doing anything other than the core product starts to add cost. Uh, but yes, Tangled, Tangled will be expanded. We're, we're messing with the roadmap of how can we get other colors and other materials in in a way that's effective. Um, and that will probably happen with another filament uh, supplier who we vetted and who we trust and that kind of thing. Because we, we have to focus on the core stuff that we do and the core stuff that we care about. Because we're making filament for our print farms and we're scraping off the top cream for you guys to get access to really affordable filament that's still made in the USA, is good quality. And in a format that you can't really get a hold of, because most people who use these type of spools very often uh, fill them up only to 3 kg, which leaves a bunch of empty space on the outside. This is a 3.5 filled spool that was a tester spool. But you see all that extra space out there? You fill it up, you get 4 kgs on there, you don't really increase your uh, shipping cost, and the person gets more material for less. So it's just 
bulk shipping is what we're doing. And oddly enough, it's more efficient. Uh, so that's the Tangled update. Um, the Kickstarter. Kickstarter, fully funded. Golf clap for all you guys. Thank you. Uh, but no, thank you guys very, very much for all the support on the Kickstarter for Tangled Testing. Uh, it was funded last week. Uh, we exceeded the fund by, I think, about like 200 bucks. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, right now, the way Kickstarter works, so next steps on all of this. Uh, the way Kickstarter works is it takes one to two weeks for them to process the funds. Uh, then we'll know how much we actually received because sometimes cards get declined or pledges get pulled and all all shenanigans happen. So we'll find out what the final what the final take was, <laughs> and then we'll get it done. We have uh, the machine finalized and quoted, um, and the uh, manufacturer standing by. Uh, we're going to get that purchased probably about next week, uh, and then it'll come on through and. For updates, a lot of the updates will come through on the podcast, not necessarily on the Kickstarter updates, um, or we will post the podcast over there, one or the other. Uh, so, yes, we will be getting the machine. It is going to take six to eight weeks for the machine to arrive. We are purchasing a Chinese tensile tester, which I know, like, given all the hype around Tangled, is very ironic, but they're the ones who know how to make stuff. So... Uh, it is a Chinese ten tensile tester. We uh, will, uh, it'll, they, when we order it, they'll have about like a week and a half to work on it, but then they go into Chinese New Year, which is a two to four week holiday uh, for the Chinese country, for China, the Chinese country, China. Uh, so they'll, they'll be off and then they'll come back, they'll finish it up, they'll ship it out, it'll take two to three weeks to ship on boat, all that kind of stuff. So it just takes a long time. And then it's going to get stuck in customs, and we're going to get reamed for that and all the other things. And it's going to not have a truck shipping it to us and so on and so forth. Just just all kinds of things will go wrong. Just FYI, because they always go wrong when you're trying to move a crate from over there to over here. So that will be coming down. But it's in progress. In the meantime, uh, we are setting up a number of other tests uh, that we will start filming and we will start releasing those videos on a Tangled Testing YouTube channel. It will not be on the Slant 3D channel, not all of them. We'll continue to release a few here pointing to the other channel uh, and there'll be an update about that when it goes out. Uh, but yeah, the Tangled Testing channel will uh, be the place where we hold all of that stuff. It'll be in a different. It'll be a very different format from what we do here on Slant 3D because Tangled Testing needs to be kind of separate from this channel. Uh, because yeah, we talk about different topics and that kind of thing. We're talking about mass production 3D printing over there. We're going to talk about this manufacturer filament, this manufacturer filament, this manufacturer filament, all the rest of it. So it can be, it can be more removed uh, from both a branding and from a content perspective. Um, because if it's Slant 3D, who runs Tangled Filament and so on and so forth, and we had a bad experience with Filament, it, it there's a lot of context around here where, like, on this podcast, I'll talk about, this filament is garbage, but then we'll go and have a tester video where that filament is in it. That's not good. Um, we will do that over on Tangled. <laughs> um, but, yes, the other YouTube channel will get ramped up. Uh, it will have ads associated with it and everything else because this is an expensive project. It's a very expensive project testing all of this stuff. Uh, if you are a filament manufacturer or some other sponsor who wants to get in early on a YouTube channel, uh, let us know uh, because that YouTube channel, we're fairly certain, will grow very quickly. The, the videos that we've done here on YouTube have been very good performers. And uh, we grew this channel from effectively zero to 60,000 subscribers in a year. We can do that again. We, we know YouTube pretty well at this point. Uh, so the, the, the team uh, on Tangled Testing is teed up to do a very good job on that. And a lot of them are going to be very fun. Uh, oh, yeah, for that, uh, in the context of Tangled Testing, there, there's kind of two operational goals with it. Number one is to collect all the data around filament. How strong is PLA when printed with this infill? So on and so forth, that kind of thing. That very kind of hard analytical stuff, which we will do to the best of our ability and to the capability possible with the budget and resources we have available. 
Uh, a number of people have reached out, and I really, really appreciate that, who have had great insights on testing and filament and that kind of stuff. And we're staying in contact and are going to try to work with like the university labs and that kind of thing where it comes available uh, to try to get this done. So um, not right now, but at some point in the future, we might put out a call to like undergrads who want to do particular tests. On, on the Tangled website, we might have like just a list of tests to be run, and somebody can pluck those send us the data and we'll we'll structure it and put a video around it so that it's shared in, in a forum that's consistent and continuous. So people can go to Tangle Testing and find all these research papers. So we'll start data aggregation as well. Uh, but that that's the data analytics side of it, which is very analytics focused and gonna be that way. The other part is just an intuitive knowledge. And by intuition, I'm like, oh, I got to make this box. It's got to sit out in the sun for two years. What material should I use? Yeah, this feels about right. In that case, we do kind of some rough hewn myth bustery type of tests that are not quite as precise as like the tinsel testing machine, but would be more akin to like the Blender video that we did. The Blender video, we got to restructure, but that that's the type of idea. When you take this material or this part or whatever it happens to be and put it in an extreme situation, how does it behave when you stretch it right to its limit? Oh, carbon fiber nylon doesn't blend at all, but TPU shreds up into tiny little shards and PLA just shatters, that kind of thing. That, that intuitive knowledge of the basic behavior of materials and situations. Oh, I drove a car over that PLA block. It didn't crush. Oh, PLA rebounds and doesn't really have any sort of like permanent deformation. That's useful to know. All of this stuff is useful to just kind of have in the toolbox of context so that when you're in a situation, you can just quickly say, PLA will probably be fine for that. I saw a car drive over it. And that's, that's the thing to do. Whatever we're putting underneath it is not as heavy as a car. So that context, that intuitive understanding of how these materials behave with certain situations. Because there's a few myths out there that like, oh, PLA is a cheap material, which means it's a weak material. That's not true. PLA has exceptional compressive strength and is actually very scratch resistant too. Um, so we'll do a number of those less sciencey tests. Um, the other component of it is, is that like tangle testing in order to be sustainable has to get views. Uh, it is another YouTube channel, so it has to get views in order to support sponsorships and uh, AdSense revenue and that kind of thing. So there's an entertainment component to it. So every once in a while, we will do a video that is just entertainment focused, which is like, yeah, can this printed part lift a car or something like that? Not very scientific, but fun to watch. Uh, so yeah, tangled testing will be all kinds of different things uh, when it all goes down. Uh, but that's kind of the update for it. Yeah, it's going to be about two months before that machine shows up, the, the tensile testing machine. But before that, uh, videos will start appearing on uh, the Tangle Testing channel, and we'll do more of kind of the, the videos that we've been doing, the Crusher videos, the, yeah, all types of different videos. All right. That's it, everybody. Appreciate you all for watching. Hope you have a great day and we'll see you again soon. Make sure to like and subscribe and tell us any sort of uh, comments or types of content that you'd like to see us make. Have a great day, everybody.